tons of tons of uh, waste uh, related to discarded uh, furniture. Um, at the same time, uh, there's more and more ambitious goals um, at European perspective with regard to reaching a more sustainable and climate neutral uh, economy by 2050. Uh, and we know that uh, applying circular economy principles is actually uh, a central avenue to, uh, to achieve these goals. Uh, but to get there, to, to reach this, this uh, state of a circular economy, well, a, a lot of actions and incentives and uh, new adaptations need to, be, uh, need to be developed, whether it's at uh, product level, at material or component level, or also at, uh, at business model level. Um, but to be, to be, in order to, to reach that state, well, a current uh, central aspect is really related to the skills of current workers of the industry. So what are the skills and competencies that are really needed uh, to accelerate that transition? And that's basically um, the whole point of this webinar is to address the state of circularity in the sector, see where it will go in the coming decades, but also concretely uh, being aware of the type of skills and competencies that uh, the industry needs to uh, develop and process to actually move forward into that, uh, that transition. So that's really about what we'll be talking about this morning. So when it comes to the program, um, beyond this short introduction, uh, Gabriela Kemendi from EFIC will give us a perspective from the, from the European furniture industry where are we at when it comes to circular economy? Where should we go uh, forward? Um, next, Ilma from Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, will obviously uh, reframe what we mean by circular economy and more concretely, what kind of skills and competencies we should be having uh, in order to move forward um, towards some, something a bit more circular. Um, then Juan Carlos Alonso uh, will uh, uh, let us know a little bit more about the Sawyer project, which uh, also can provide you with uh, very interesting insights on, on forecasted scenario for the furniture sector. Where can we be in 2030 when it comes to circular economy in the sector? So beyond those three, uh, the three uh, speakers, then we'll take a little bit of time uh, with the consortium members to introduce you to what we've been doing with um, the Fern 360 project. And we'll, uh, we'll guide you basically through, um, through the project the training curriculum, the type of modules that are uh, presented in the, in the online platform. And, and so you'll, you'll get to know at the end of this session a bit more about the training and hopefully uh, you'll be convinced that it might be something uh, relevant for you. At the end of the, those four sessions, we'll save some time for questions and answers. So if you do have questions during the presentation, please use uh, the, chat, uh, the chat section of, of Zoom. And we'll try to, uh, to, uh, to pick up a few relevant questions for, for all of the panelists uh, so that they have space to, uh, to answer your questions. And at the end of this, we'll have obviously a short set of conclusions before continuing our day and, and heading towards the, the weekend. So um, I hope it's, uh, it's clear and fine with you. Uh, now I will invite uh, Gabriela maybe to, uh, to share her screen and we can start directly with uh, with EFIC position on circular economy and circular, two point, circular economy 2.0. Thank you very much for the invitation to this webinar. I'm Gabriela Kemendi, um, Secretary General of EFIC. Congratulations to the project partners for the results and the training materials developed uh, in this project. I also look forward to the interesting presentations of the, the other presenters that we have today. And um, I have been invited to give a presentation about the EFIC um, position paper on the Circular Economy Action Plan. But before that, I would like to start with um, some basics about our association, EFIC. So EFIC um, is the European Furniture Industries Confederation. It was founded in 2006 and now represents over 70% of the total turnover of the furniture industries in Europe. We currently have 16 national federations as members and one individual company, which is IKEA. So our association has been growing over the years um, and there's still some potential for it to grow further. 
The furniture industries employ about 1 million people in 120,000 enterprises, mainly SMEs and micro enterprises, with a turnover of 96 billion euros. The EU furniture industries produce and consume 25% of the world furniture each and are export oriented. The main areas of activity for EFIC are um, a deeper harmonization of the single market. This is what we thrive for because it would be beneficial for SMEs and micro enterprises operating in the sector. International trade, so we're looking into opportunities um, with um, ongoing negotiations for trade agreements, but we're also looking into market access barriers that can affect the sector. We are social partners together with the woodworking industries. And in this platform, we're looking into the challenges um, related to skills, to the aging workforce, and to health and safety that can affect the sector. And last but not least, environment and circular economy is very high up on our agenda. We're very actively working now on um, initiatives stemming from the Green Deal and from the Circular Economy Action Plan. Our members have a strong focus on circular economy and sustainability. EFIC welcomes the Green Deal and the commitment of the EU to be climate neutral by 2050. We strongly support a green recovery, which should have circularity at its heart as a key enabler, not only to the climate objectives, but also to bringing resilience, affordability and new jobs um, to the EU and to the industries. The furniture industries in, the, in Europe are ready to be involved in the transition to the circular economy and are already adapting and promoting sustainable business models based on reuse, um, refurbishment, remanufacturing. Over the years, we have collaborated with the supply chain because we believe that it is important to have an open dialogue and to learn from each other and have collected also a number of best practices which you can find on our website. We're also involved in the Sawyer project that uh, was mentioned earlier, which looks into how the circular economy transition will affect skills in the furniture sector by 2030. Going now into the um, EFIC position paper on circular economy. So we developed this position paper in response to the circular economy action plan that was published in March this year. Um, we have identified a number of challenges and opportunities that are linked to the transition to a circular economy, covering the different phases of furniture manufacturing, so furniture production, consumption, and end of life. But before I go into the three sections, I would like to um, present some horizontal and transversal principles that we have identified, which you can see now on the screen. First and foremost, harmonization at EU level is needed. For example, for parameters that measure circularity and for ways of reporting. So harmonization is um, crucial in order to avoid the fragmentation of the internal market. The EU also has the possibility now to set an example at international level and replicate requirements in other parts of the globe. And for this, um, it is advisable that um, European standards on tr are translated into ISO ones, being able to work on what has already been done in Europe, increasing the product safety and the competitiveness of the furniture industries. Imported goods need to follow the same rules as products that are produced in the EU and for this market surveillance need to be increased. Um, as well as customs controls. Um, and when it comes to harmonization, we believe that it is very important that the EU monitors the ambitions of the member states and the implementation of the member states of EU circular economy rules to avoid, again, that there is a fragmentation of um, the internal market. We have some concerns, for example, with the French legislation on circular economy, which was published in February earlier this year. And um, there are a number of provisions that could bring some barriers to, to the sector, such as um, a sorting logo called Treeman, some new fees um, under extended producer responsibility scheme and uh, a repairability index among others. Um, apart from harmonization, which is um, very important, we believe that 
there needs to be a realistic transition into the circular economy. No one should be left behind. And um, as we know, the, the majority of companies operating in the sector are SMEs and microenterprises, so they should be given the opportunity to, um, to have a step-by-step -step transition to the circular economy. Digitalization has a very large potential when it comes to a circular economy and to enhancing the single markets. We just need to ensure that there aren't too many databases, for example, that are that are created, um, which could um, place burdens on the on the companies. Simple and smart rules are needed. Sometimes the best solutions can be found by the industry itself. We know that a, a number of um, research and development um, um, opportunities need to be seized um, when it comes to the transition to a circular economy, especially when it comes to new materials, but not only. The, the challenges related to how skills will change uh, with this transition should also be addressed to make sure that workers have the right um, skills and knowledge um, and are not left behind. And um, I'm um, pleased to, to see the results of this uh, project in this regard. Also very important is to have clear definitions and a common language. Um, otherwise, again, we, we see the, the threat of a fragmentation of the internal market. Dialogue is important with stakeholders. It needs to be kept open to learn from each other, to exchange best practices. Um, and the circular economy um, platform at EU level is a very good tool in this regard. And all in all, we believe that there should be a value chain approach uh, when it comes to the circular economy, going from the sourcing of raw materials to the end of life of products. So we've tackled now the general and transversal principles that we have identified. Um, I'm not now going to go into the three main sections of our policy paper, starting with circularity during furniture production. So as we know in the circular economy action plan, um, a sustainable product policy framework has been announced, which uh, will have at its core the revision of the eco-design directive. It will be widened to also cover non-energy related products. Um, there will also be some legislative proposals to look into aspects such as product durability, reusability, upgradability, etc. And we know that furniture will be in the scope of this sustainable product policy framework um, together with some other products um, such as text textiles or electronics. When it comes to um, sustainable product policies, we know that circular product design needs to be at um, their core as Circular design provides an opportunity to prepare products for the circular loops. And um, when it comes to um, the, the main principles of um, circular design, we know that this relies on, first of all, an efficient use of materials, including renewable and uh, recycled materials, designing products in a way that materials and parts can be separated, and a responsible use of chemicals. When it comes to the potential introduction of eco-design rules for the furniture sector, we believe that these should not drive the market extensively as they might be difficult to implement due to the lack of tenders. Therefore, all in all, it should rather be driven by demand for circular products. So the um, eco-design principles should rather be driven by demand for circular products than by regulations. We also know that um, the eco-design criteria will not work for all products in the same way. And uh, I'm not sure whether you're aware of uh, this um, circular design guide that IKEA has been developing over the past four years. We come to the conclusion that there are two principles that can be applied to all of their products, um, such as standardization and the focus on renewable and recycled material. But then there are a number of other principles that cannot all be applied at the same time to a specific product, and might be that there might be a need to, to combine those uh, depending on the specificities of the product. And um, I'm speaking here about um, design for repairability, remanufacturing, assembly, disassembly, 
and, and some other principles. When it comes to um, the circular design and uh, circular furniture product production, there are some challenges that we can see um, in, in this path. First of all, when circular product design is applied, there might be a lack of um, materials and parts for substitution. Um, there might be increased costs. We see some challenges with regard to the traceability of chemicals, and we believe that um, systems should be put in place for tracking these chemicals and uh, making sure that they do not end up in recycled products. There is there are some contradictions between circular economy and um, chemical legislation that needs to be addressed. And sometimes um, there are some barriers to, for example, eliminating toxic substances from the design phase. And I would like to give you one example here. Um, the EFIC established a, um, an alliance four years ago called the Alliance for Flame Retardant Free Furniture. And um, it gathers stakeholders ranging from industry to firefighters, um, NGOs, and trade unions. Um, everyone in this alliance shares a common concern about the impact on, the he on health, environment, and circular economy of the use of toxic flame retardants in furniture, including a potential increase in fire toxicity, showing therefore no real demonstrated fire safety benefits. And um, sometimes furniture and bedding manufacturers need to use textiles or foam that has been treated with um, toxic flame retardants because of um, stringent regulations that are put in place requiring um, compliance with an open flame test. Um, so this is one example of how um, even if the furniture sector would like to eliminate toxic flame retardants, sometimes um, they, they are still needed in order to, to comply with, um, with the regulations. So we believe in this specific case that the wide action is needed against the use of toxic flame retardants in furniture um, and are um, in touch with the competent services of the European Commission in this regard. All in all, we believe that um, circularity objectives, chemical safety and health should be combined when it comes to, to the use of these um, toxic flame retardants in, in furniture. Going now to circularity during furniture consumption, um, again, the Circular Economy Action Plan lists a number of initiatives that will be taken to empower consumers and public buyers, including the revision of the EU consumer law to ensure that consumers receive trustworthy information on products um, at the point of sale. The Commission also intends to set actions against greenwashing and propose to substantiate environmental claims. Um, there is a proposal to create the so-called product passports, but not only, there will be some other tools as well for providing information to consumers, such as watermarks and tagging. And uh, when it comes to the development of the product passports, um, especially, we very much welcome this. We believe that an EU tool um, should be established at EU level that provides information to consumers and um, is based on harmonized definitions, um, harmonized standards at EU and international level to make sure that consumers have um, the right tool in place to make um, an informed choice and to compare products that are available on the market. Such EU information schemes should provide the main characteristics of furniture products and they, have, they should have a pragmatic approach. And only the, the information that is needed to the consumers should be provided um, so that it's easy to understand, clear, concise, and useful. Um, it's, I would like to, um, to bring in again the, the necessity and the need to have a common language when it comes to the definition of um, of parameters that define circularity, such as um, what is uh, long lifetime, what is durability, what is repairability. This is all needed in order to have a common approach and a level playing field. We also believe that in the development of the um, product passports, 
industry should be involved. Um, it will be industry who will need to insert the information on the product within these product passwords. So they should definitely work in practice. So it's very important that um, business is involved. Um, when it comes to public buyers, um, we believe that there is a large potential with green public procurement to drive circularity. And we, we welcome the, um, the approach of the Commission of uh, suggesting to introduce minimum mandatory green public procurement criteria. So all in all, we believe that <clears throat> consumers should have a very active role when it comes to the transition to the circularity. Um, we have seen a societal shift um, and many consumers are more and more concerned about the products that they buy. However, there still needs to be um, a societal change to, to a certain degree. We're also concerned about the proliferation of a number of voluntary tools and labeling schemes that are seen out there, which again, do not really help the consumer to make a, a choice, an informed choice. Um, and then again, the lack of a common language, which should definitely be developed um, to make sure that we have a level playing field. Going to circularity during um, waste management, again, the commission announces in the Circular Economy Action Plan a series of actions which we welcome, such as um, actions to enhance waste policy in support of uh, waste prevention and circularity, enhancing circularity in our non-toxic environments, and creating a market for secondary raw materials. We, as furniture, European furniture industry, um, believe that there needs to be an acceleration of the use of waste as a resource and the waste management sector needs to be empowered all in all. Um, so far we've seen a number of challenges related to, to, to the waste management sector, such as for example barriers around the definition of waste. Um, many times the, the waste lists um, differ from member state to member state and are not compatible with the um, EU waste catalog, which um, brings some barriers for moving waste from one country to another. Um, and then I would like to also give one example on um, barriers related to the waste ownership. Um, in some markets, for example, a used sofa passed on by the consumer becomes waste uh, owned by the municipality. So in this case, it is um, more difficult to engage in repair, refurbishment and uh, remanufacturing activities. Um, as we also all know, there's, there is a low um, collection and reverse logistics infrastructure for the furniture sector, um, leading to low recycling rates, for example. We believe that um, extended producer responsibility schemes have a large potential to, to solve and tackle this issue. And um, concretely, we believe that a harmonized scheme at EU level, um, a harmonized extended producer responsibility scheme at EU level for furniture should be introduced with clear rules and responsibilities for the players involved, um, with um, harmonization of reporting obligations, covering online trade, definitions of scope, um, categorization of products, etc., which should also set an EU-wide approach for eco-modulation of fees um, within the, the upcoming PR scheme. So, um, thank you very much for the attention. This was it um, from my side. Um, you have my contact here on the slide in case you want to, to reach out for any questions. I will ha be happy to, to respond to these. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Gabriela. Um, I suggest we move straight to um, to the presentation from from Ellen MacArthur. So, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here and present what we have the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and some of the findings from one of our collaborative projects that I believe might be very relevant to hear for all of you today. And I thought that I would uh, quickly go through the basics of the circular economy because we find that it's always useful to just have the framing of circle economy in mind at the back of our minds and then I will go deeper into the findings key findings from the co-project that looked into what are the key competency gaps in business specific functions 
that would help companies transition to the circular economy. Uh, so I am from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and the foundation works in various areas in relation to circular economy with a mission to accelerate the global transition to a circular economy. And we provide rigorous data-led research and analysis on the latest thought of circular economy. We look into systemic change and convene systemic stakeholders to achieve that change in areas such as plastic, food, or fashion, for instance. And we also provide platforms for pre-competitive collaboration for the businesses and governments and, and higher education institutions to come together to find innovative solutions and just have a conversation about the circle economy. So these are some of the things that we do and talking about circle economy I guess it's quite clear for everyone today that the way we operate in the world is very linear meaning that we take take resources from the ground we turn them into products and things that we use quite often for a relatively short amount of time and then we dispose of them very quickly. Therefore, we keep using up the limited resources and we keep piling up the waste out there in this world. And we see that there are many issues in relation to that. So one of them is, for instance, the ch structural waste embedded in the system. And we can see that through examples such as the fact that the car is being unused 92% of the time or in Europe, on average, the office building would be unused 50-60% of the time. So all these things that we have, they just stay there unused. Of course, we also see uh, how the resources are running out and also the various negative externalities that we have, such as climate change, air, water, soil pollution, uh, the loss of biodiversity. And finally, this, the different approach also provides a great economic opportunity. So covering the circular economy principles, we say that it's based on three principles, designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use, and regenerating natural systems. So just to say a bit more about each one of them. So when we say designing out waste and pollution, it's about the fact that the current waste and pollution is actually, actually the result of how we have designed and produced things. Therefore, by changing the decisions upstream, we can make sure from the get-go that it doesn't turn into waste and it's not polluting. And an example here could be a company called DSM Niaga that produces carpets and they have developed uh, three key design principles that underpin their circular economy thinking, which is how to use the lowest possible diversity of ingredients, how to use only materials that have tested positive for impact on human health, and then how to connect different materials in a way that allows easy disconnecting at the end of each use. And as a result, they have created a carpet that is much healthier and fully recyclable and without compromising on performance. Um, and our second principle about keeping products in use is about how can we can make sure that these products and materials are circulating within the system for as long as possible. Because every time we create something, we invest both, well, materials, we invest the labor, we invest the energy. So if it turns into landfill or gets incinerated, in essence, all that gets lost. So we want to make sure that the value is preserved for as long as possible. And of course, one of the ways to do that, especially, or also that's also applicable in the furniture industry, is thinking about uh, not ownership but access of products for the for the consumers, for the customers. And we know that, for instance, the demand for office furniture is growing rapidly. And yet, at the same time, manufacturing office furniture requires a lot of materials and energy, and only small percent of that. Oh, and then the, there is great waste coming out of the furniture industry, but only a small percent of that gets recycled. So, for instance, the company Ahrent, they manufacture office furniture products with modularity, disassembly, and life extension as core design principles, making sure that the furniture lasts longer. And then they offer their customers furniture as a service uh, offering where customers pay a monthly, fee, a monthly fee and then return the furniture when they no longer need it. And then a friend is a company, they can either recycle it or repair it or and resell it or refurbish and resell it again. And the final principle is about regenerating natural systems. And it's about making sure that all our activities 
contribute to enhancement of our natural environment rather than just preserving the status quo. And of course, there are plenty of examples of regenerative agriculture, for instance, and how we can change our agricultural practices, but also in built environment, for instance, uh, the Venlo City Hall, it was designed with cradle to cradle principles in mind, which, well, from the get go, preserves uh, the use of virgin materials because the building and materials used are lasting longer, but also the way they, for instance, embedded green elements into the walls and the gardens inside the building contribute to the air, to better air quality and therefore improving the systems around them. And then we also talk about the circle economy systems, systems diagram, which is always useful to have at the back of our minds. And the first aspect and the key aspect of it is that we always want to uh, look differently and separate biological cycle materials from technological cycle materials. And anything that would be considered as waste or pollution within the natural environment should be considered as part of the technical cycle. And we want these materials, these products, to be in circulation, well, almost perpetually. And then anything that is in biological cycle, we want to make sure that they do end up back in the natural environment and therefore returning all the nutrients, all the nutrients all the mineral, minerals that are contained within that product or within that material. And looking at uh, the loops of, on this diagram, especially on the right side, so on the blue side, which I think would be much more applicable and relevant for listeners here. So they, they relate to the technical cycle and it's about how we can preserve value for as long as possible. Because we believe that the best value for both consumers and the companies is when you can, let's say if you have a product, you can use the product as is for as long as possible by enabling sharing or reuse or resell at the same level of quality. And if something happens that there are easy ways to maintain and prolong the life of that product, and there are ways to reuse and redistribute it, and finally it can be refurbished and remanufactured. And the final loop would be recycling and it never goes back to a landfill or it never gets incinerated. And these value loops, how to reuse and share, how to maintain and repair, how to refurbish, how to recycle, are really good for companies to keep in mind in terms of thinking about new uh, business models and new ways to commercialize uh, what they offer. So this is like the bird's, bird's eyes overview of the circular economy. And now I would like to get into perhaps more interesting part for the audience today, which is about circular business competencies building. So as I said, uh, we provide platform for companies to come together and look into various, well, circular economy related challenges and then try to find solutions to address these challenges. So now a year and a half ago, Philips and Exeter University came together to look into what are the key competency gaps when it comes to implementing circular economy and business specific functions. So they opened the call for our network members and several other companies that you see written on your screens joined the cohort. So we had Coti, SCT, H&M Group, PA Consulting, Tarket, TU Delft University uh, and University of Sao Paulo. And then these groups set out to investigate what are these missing competencies in marketing and sales in procurement and supply chain and in product creation and design. So the way it worked that each company dedicated several of their team members from the specific function. And then we had three groups per function of consisting of members from each company. And there were three rounds of discussions looking into what are the key challenges when it comes to circular economy that each function faces? How do they currently address that? What would be useful to have in order to be more effective at bringing circular economy thinking into that particular function? So there is the results that I will present. It's a good starting point, but I would say that by no means they are conclu conclusive or definitive. Uh, and yet again, as I said, I think I believe it's a good starting point to think about what should be the things addressed when you want to embed circular economy thinking across your entire organization. 
Uh, so there are some of the key learnings that came about from the discussion. So, and in a way to, it relates to what the previous speaker, Gabriela, was saying and starting with the fact that circular economy understanding is key and it's definitely about sh having the shared understanding of the key terms and having the key gl the glossary that everybody agrees and endorses. Uh, the second point was about the importance of collaboration. And again, I believe Gabriela mentioned that in her speech as well, the need for dialogue between different stakeholders. But in this case, what we discovered is that collaboration is needed between business functions, so within the organization, so to break the functional silos. But also the collaboration is needed between different companies and between different industries. And finally, what came out very strongly is the need to make a case for a circular economy. And there were quite a few conversations about the need uh, to start circular economy projects, perhaps on a smaller scale. But the challenge is always to make a case for it and to show the benefits, especially the financial benefits from the very beginning. First, because it hadn't been done before. And second, because very often circle economy thinking relates to a longer term thinking where you have to take into account, let's say, total cost of ownership throughout the entire use cycle. And currently in the organizations, the short term thinking is still prevailing. So there is a bit of a mindset shift challenge when it comes to it. So these were some of the key observations uh, coming out from the project. Uh, and this is the key output or the key findings in terms of what are these competency gaps for each function. And I will go deeper into, into them, explaining them a bit more. But as you see, there are several for marketing and sales and then product creation and design and procurement and supply chain share two competencies between them or missing competencies between them. And then there were two circular economy and un, un, related competencies that underpin the need to understand and communicate circular economy across the entire organization. So going deeper into them, uh, so the two core competencies that we saw as a starting point was circular economy understanding and then how to communicate the circular economy. So when it comes to circular economy understanding, yes, it's about understanding what the concept is, understanding the taxonomy or having the shared glossary. But it's also about understanding how circular economy translates into what you do at your company or translates into your company strategy. Um, and then that you know what to do about it within your line of work or in your specific function. And I think just from our work at the foundation, what we quite often see that uh, circular economy as a concept is very easy to understand. It's like, yes, it just makes sense. But then when you start thinking about the ability to apply it and implement it, this is where the complexities begin and this is where it becomes much more difficult. And then this next step uh, after that is the ability to communicate the circular economy. Again, very often we see that the people say, uh, yes, I know what the circular economy is. And yet when asked to actually articulate it, they find it much more difficult. And given how much collaboration is needed to embed circular economy successfully, and you have to talk internally to your internal stakeholders and with different functions, but also you need to talk about it externally. You need to bring your suppliers on board. You need to bring your customers on board. So ability to communicate it clearly to show the value or the benefits of the circular economy is one of the key competencies in order to implement it effectively. Then going next into business specific so looking at the marketing and sales and maybe i'll just i see that there are some new chats if there's anything yes anna thank you anna so she shared some of the case studies brilliant yes so talking about the marketing and sales missing competencies so to begin with, it's selling circular economy solution in a story. So it's about being able to move from transactional sales approach beyond selling the product to providing a service that offers better economic, environmental and social outcomes. And data mod modeling, and it's about being able to analyze all the data harnessed by a variety of digital tools. And digitalization, as we know, is a big enabler for circular economy. But then we need to translate all the data collected into some actionable insights that could inform changes in services and products, into sales approach, into messaging, 
and things like that. Uh, the next one, consultative selling, helping clients transform. It's how to work with customers to translate the principles and concepts of the circle economy into meaningful value propositions. And the range of circle economy value creation opportunities, they can involve disrupting the one-way relationship with a client and finding new forms for the two-way relationships. Or to put it in other words, suddenly your client may become your supplier as well. Well, for instance, if you sell them furniture and then you want to take it back, they will become the supplier for perhaps reused or, or used recycled material that you can turn and turn, turn into new furniture afterwards. So how do you develop that kind of relationship? How do you take it back? And then, and yes, managing, changing customer relationships. It's about being able to map out that extended landscape of customer stakeholders and understanding and addressing their needs and engaging them in conversations concerning their different role in the sales process. So this is when it comes to marketing and sales and for product creation and design. So to begin with, uh, one of the key things was how to assess the circularity of a product, its materials and components. And it's about being able to define the circular requirements for a product and assess and compare the materials and components needed against each other and against the set of a circular economy criteria. Um, and then calculating the cost benefit risk of extended product life, it's about being able to make a total overview of the extended use cycle costs and benefits. And it includes looking into multiple use cycles as opposed to commonly used currently one use cycle to assess what would be the real value that the company will get over time, including assessment of the risks. And these two uh, particular competency gaps, so ability to assess the circularity of a product and its materials, and also the ability to calculate the costs, it's quite applicable both for product creation and design functions, so for designers, but also for people in procurement. But then specifically for designers, so the ability to design for multiple use cycles and ability to bring different strategies to do that, uh, it's another key competency. And then how to link customer demands with the reverse logistics, which is about being able to connect customer demand and willingness to bring back the products with the implication it has for reverse logistics. And talking about procurement and supply chain, so as I was saying that the first two are the same as for designers, so how to assess the circularity of a product and how to calculate the costs, benefits and risks of extended use cycle. But then it's about uh, ability to manage changing supply relationships and how to map out this changing ecosystem of suppliers and then how to negotiate new types of contracts to reflect the expanding role of suppliers in procurement. Because just like customer relationships are changing the same as with a supplier. So first you buy something from the supplier, but at some point you may want to sell it back to them, in which case it's almost like you become their customer. And how do you manage that complexity of a relationship? And then generally how to understand circular supply chain and how to define the circularity within the supply chains and identify opportunities where the current linear supply chain could be transformed into circular one or where could you find ways to close the loops so to speak so this is the quick overview of the key competencies uh, project and what were the key findings and both the report and the finding document they're available online and we can share the links afterwards but just to say that in relation to quite a few things mentioned or quite a few competency gaps. There are a few resources that we already have or that we're currently working at the foundation that might be useful for you to know about. So to begin with, um, next slide. So to begin with, uh, of course, we have to mention Circulitics, which is the circular economy measurement tool for the company. So it's a company level tool. And according to our research, right now it's the most comprehensive tool available in the market and it allows each company to look into their enabling conditions that we believe are needed for circular economy to be successfully implemented and also to look into their material flows 
inputs and outputs of the material and circularity of that. And then these two are combined into an aggregated score. Uh, and it's free to use. Any company can register. And again, all the documents in relation to Circulatics is available online. And you can find and read more about it and get the score yourself. And the second set of resources is our circular design guide that has been around for a while and has been useful for so many different designers across so many different industries. And we can share the link to that. And it's definitely something we recommend you check. And finally, a few things in the pipeline. So we have just completed open to all linear to circulate webinar series for professionals working in circular economy. And it's been a great success and we'll definitely at some point think about how to, uh, how to repeat that. Uh, so probably later in the year and the information will be available online. But I would say this, is, this would give a really good overview of what the circular economy is. So let's say for your staff members or colleagues who haven't really heard much about circular economy, that would be a great first step. Because as we said, that circular economy understanding is key. Another thing that we're working is, is how to communicate the circular economy slide deck. So it will be a custom, customizable open source slide deck that provides key circular economy information that you can then use for your own needs. And it present, it, the slide deck will present the business case for circular economy very clearly and simply and whether you need to communicate that to your customers or your suppliers or to even internally to different team members, it will be a great resource to have and to use. We're also working on circular procurement framework, so how to engage your suppliers around circular economy conversations and also throughout the current procurement process, where are points where circular economy interventions could be low-hanging fruits or perhaps where are the points within the procurement process where you need to think about it more strategically and where your circular economy strategy could influence how you do procurement and change your procurement. And the final one, again, to help you and your colleagues understand the circular economy better is train the trainer resource that should be launched in autumn. Um, and it will be, again, a set of resources for you to use that. But you'll also have to go through the webinars in order to get trained how to talk about circular economy. And then you'll be able to do that with your colleagues. Um, and yes, we definitely hear the need for circular economy glossary and to have common and shared definitions and it's something potentially in the pipeline as well that we will be able to share publicly in the later months. Um, so that's all I had to say today and maybe just the last thing is that we're always looking for good case practices, especially, especially how circular economy is implemented in specific business functions. So if you know or if you do some great things already, have great successful projects within your organization, uh, I would love to hear more about it. And I can share my email in the chat afterwards. Uh, so that's all for me and thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Ilma. Very, uh, very interesting uh, presentation, full of insight. Just a, a couple of things. Um, as you may have seen in the chat, Anna from the, the foundation has also been uh, kindly, super kind to, uh, to send some uh, links as Ilma was talking. So I invite you to, to keep, keep those links also and, and uh, have time to, uh, to go through, through them, whether it's the, the case studies or, or the resources that uh, the foundation has been, uh, has been developing uh, over the years. So really useful uh, material that actually we, we uh, for some parts, have been also uh, using or presenting in the, in the Fern360 uh, training. So just, just to say that, a couple of things as well. Um, there's a couple of Q&A that have been inserted. Uh, we will not try to reply to it straight. We will try to wait at the end of all the presentations so that maybe some of the answers will be answered actually throughout the presentation. But do not hesitate otherwise, if you have some questions for, for Ilma or for Gabriela in the former presentation, to, uh, to type those questions and we'll try to uh, answer uh, the most relevant ones uh, in, in due time. But now I will leave the floor um, to Juan Carlos. Okay, thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you all for the opportunity to present here in this webinar the results or some of the results of the Sawyer project. I'm Juan Carlos Alonso, the Thin Film Circular Economy expert in the Sawyer project. 
And the idea of this presentation is to present to you the forecast as a scenario for the furniture sector in 2030. First of all, a few words about the, about the project itself. SOYER is the acronym of Holistic Approach for the Identification of Skills and Safety Needs towards the growing sustainability and circularity of furniture sector. And the idea of this project is to analyze how circular economy is going to affect and transform the European furniture sector in 2030. And we are exploring how this transition can affect the existing jobs and their tax, work of health and safety risks and their training needs. So the idea is in this uh, two-year project, uh, analyze these aspects. Uh, the coordinator of the project is Zemfin, uh, but it is also the uh, important participation of other partners, like the European Federation of Building and uh, Woodworkers, the European Furniture Industry Confederation, Federleño Arredo, and the European Furniture Manufacturers Federation. Also in the project that involved four te uh, thematic experts and seven national furniture entities from different European countries. The first resource that I would like to present from, from this project is the state of the art of circular economy in the furniture sector. You can download the draft report uh, from the project website. And, in this, and the idea is in the few days, we will also uh, uh, show to you the two final reports, one about the state of the art of circular economy in the furniture sector at Europe level, another report about the state of the art of circular economy in the furniture sector in seven specific European countries, including Spain, Italy, France, Bulgaria, Romania, the Netherlands, and Sweden. And the idea of this report is to analyze the situation of different, uh, of di of different instruments that, that uh, can act as promoter of the circular economy in the sector. We are talking about legislative instruments like the circular economy package, but also some directives about the use of hazardous substances and other kind of legislative instruments. And also we are analyzing voluntary instruments like, for example, green public procurement, equal labels, green building certification, etc. And also other policies and strategies, like cascading use of wood, by economy, etc. So the report analyzes the level of implementation of each instruments at the European level and also in these uh, seven European countries, just to define how these uh, instruments can promote uh, the circularity in, in the sector. But the, the, the report that, we will, that I would like to present to you in more detail is the forecast scenario in relation to the circular economy in 2030. You can also download the report from this from the project from the project website, and this report is based in three main activities: the state of the art report that I have just presented to you, focuses on level of deployment of selected instruments. The second one is the forecasting online survey that was conducted uh, with the involvement of 50 European experts from 15 European countries to evaluate the level of probability and the impact of 49 forecasted evolution, which are related with this instrument. That means in the project we have proposed this 49 forecasted evolution and the different experts, as well in this online survey, has evaluated the level of probability and the impact of this uh, forecast evolutions in the, in the, with the vision of uh, 2030. So it is the different uh, forecast evolutions which uh, were prioritized and were ranked according to this level of probability and impact. And the third one is the international work workshop organized in Brussels and involved, uh, involving 20 experts from nine European countries that in this workshop, they were analyzed the survey results and it was uh, focused on this uh, forecasted evolution. All these activities give us uh, enough information to make uh, to forecast this scenario in 2030, and this scenario is summarized in this uh, vision statement. This vision statement includes, uh, for example, the broadly digitalized furniture sector, the offering of um, products and, serv and services with environmental consensus design the use of low impact uh, traceable raw materials, the sustainable manufacturing processes, the best, use of and the best usage and recovery scenario, the need of information for the customers about the sustainable characteristics of the products, 
and also the different aspects from the authorities related to the sustainable, the promoting of sustainable end of life scenarios, expanding green public procurement, and also about activities regarding material efficiency policies. The report, in this case, analyzes and in detail each of these aspects, and uh, you could see in the report an analysis what we are meaning or what we are talking about, uh, the different topics about digitalization for the sector, etc. One important vision of, of this statement is the role of the different actors on, on the development of this, of this uh, scenario. And I would like to share with you this vision for the different for the different forecast scenarios forecast scenario actors. Regarding the digitalized formative sector, it is forecasted a massive use of digital tools that can, in some cases can be used to promote circular economy. We are talking about tools about mass customization for customer, uh, that means on demand manufacturing, etc. Also tools uh, uh, for a digital manufacturing, from the design uh, step, uh, we are talking about virtual modeling, to an efficient manufacturing, we uh, are talking about uh, to all the technologies about uh, Industry 4.0, and distribution, we are talking about smart logistics, etc. Also, these tools will be used to uh, the traceability of substance, materials, and products for one side, to facilitate this information to the customer, but also, for example, to the recyclers or, no, or other stakeholders that could add value to this circular economy. And also, we have forecasted an increase, a significant increase on the e-commerce that change, we will change the marketing activities uh, and the relation between the customer and the different manufacturers. Talking about the good based uh, manufacturing, uh, furniture manufacturing industry, obviously they have a significant role on this uh, forecasted scenario. The first one is by uh, an increase of the offer of products and services with environmental and conscientious design, considering the entire, entire life cycle. That means we consider that it will increase of this, um, on the offer of these eco designer products considering different aspects, not only materials, but also how to use the durability, reparability, etc. Also, it will be an increase in the use of more sustainable and traceable raw materials. That means it, it will be needed to offer uh, or to use more sustainable raw materials, and it, this will imply an increase in the change of cost of the or other kind of, of tools to facilitate this traceability of raw materials. The need of, uh, to have a clear picture about uh, the origin of these materials, raw materials, will imply that the manufacturers should have a better knowledge and control of the supply chain. That means they will need more information about the origin of these raw materials, how these raw materials are processed, the logistics to arrive to the manufacturing plant, etc. Looking to the manufacturing process itself, it is for an increase in the coefficient of these manufacturing processes. Uh, that means to reduce the environmental impact using, um, for example, renewable energy, energy or using more, efficiency, more efficient processes or reducing the, the use of uh, materials, etc., or reducing the generation of waste. And this will imply that the manufacturers should have a greater knowledge about the manufacturing processes impact. That means to have a clear picture, which is the, the impact that they are producing and how to reduce this impact. Also, the manufacturers will include that they should take in mind the end of life scenario. That means the manufacturer will be responsible in partially for this end of life scenario. Then they will think how to increase or how to improve the reparability, reparability potential of the products, how, how to facilitate the disassembly of these products, how to facilitate the recovery of the materials, etc. So the, manufacturer, the manufacturers will have a greater control about the use and end of life scenario of their products, also related with possible future uh, expanded uh, products and responsibility schemes, etc. And also, it is clear that it will be an increase on the new business models. That means uh, to change the mind from product to services, 
using, for example, uh, strategies like renting or leasing and, and so on. Other important actor of this uh, forecast scenario are the customer itself. Obviously, the customer, the customers has uh, have an important role on on the implementation of circularity or circular economy. And but the most important point is the increase of demand of information about the environmental profile of the products. And uh, it's important to analyze how to supply this information from uh, in a clear uh, way and, and in an understandable way. But it's clear that the customer will demand more information on this environmental profile. But this information could be provided with different digital tools. We are talking perhaps uh, about the product passport, but other digital tools that could cut forward how to transfer this information to the customers. But also, we are, not, we are not only talking about environmental profile. It will be an increase of demand of information about a social profile of the product. We are talking about uh, the labor conditions where the products are manufactured, uh, et cetera. And also, and it is important also, the demand of information on how to repair and maintain the product and how to proceed to disposal it at the equilibrium. So it will be an increased demand of information from the customer about this, uh, about these different uh, issues. And it is important to analyze how to supply this information and how to supply this harmonized information to the customer that was already commented in the previous, in the previous presentation. And the last point in this case is the actors, the, in the end is the possible actors in the administration itself, and the increase in the definition of mechanisms towards the most sustainable end of life scenario. We are talking about extended product responsibility schemes on other, on other uh, schemes, just to uh, show how to present and how to, uh, how to boost this sustainable scenario. So uh, it is an important role from the from the administration to favor this favorable end of life scenario. Also, as in some presentations have commented, if we foresee a definition of eco design requirement for some specific products, not for all, but it could be a need to define these eco design requirements with the agreement of the administration, but also from the sector. How to define these eco design requirements, especially related to some uh, energy, material efficiency aspect like durability, uh, availability of repair, of repair parts, and so on and so on. Also, it is defining that uh, it's it forecasted an implementation of lead legislation on circular economy and waste. That means we will foresee that it will be some recycling targets for the materials used in the furniture sector, for example, wood or other, other materials. And it will be an, an important uh, legislation about uh, the recycling and the how to take advantage of the waste from different materials. Also, it was also mentioned that it is foreseen a promotion of the green public and private procurement schemes with more specific requirements, uh, uh, talking about circular, uh, circular economy aspects, let's say commented uh, durability or information to the, to the customer about how to repair or how to recycle the, the product. But also not only public, but also we see a, an initial effort on also to promote green private, private uh, procurement schemes. Regarding material efficiency policy, for example, cascading use of wood of bioeconomy, it will be also a new uh, directive or new uh, policies regarding how to increase these material efficiency aspects. Uh, uh, for example, the use of recycled materials, how to guarantee the quality of these recycled materials, how to guarantee the use of, of less hazardous substances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it will be an increase on these policies to promote the cascading use of wood or by economy. In this case, for example, for as, as commented, for the use for promoting the cascading use of wood, it's important to have a clear traceability of the hazardous substance used in the products and how to limit this use. And finally, 
We also foresee an increase in the funding programs to support these research and demonstration projects on circular economy for different sectors, but also for the furniture sector as a, a, a key sector for the implementation of this circular economy. We are talking about uh, funding uh, programs, for the, especially for demonstration projects that uh, will show the results of uh, case studies and good practices. I will try to show very quickly uh, all these actors and this uh, forecast scenario. As I commented, we could show or we could download this information from the project website. And also in this project website, we will uh, upload all the future steps of the project because as, as, uh, because as we commented, this forecast scenario will be used to analyze the impact of the circular economy on the different uh, jobs in the furniture sector and their ties, but also about the impact of the working, uh, work, working work health and, and safety risks and also the need of a specific training needs, etc. So uh, my recommendation is to maintain and to see this, uh, to visit this uh, website to download the, the future uh, reports on the, of the project. This is all from my side. I will try to to stay in this uh, ten minutes uh, presentation. So. If you have any questions or comments about the project, please feel free to comment out, to come to send to us. And again, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, thank you uh, for this presentation. So I really invite uh, all the all the participants to uh, to go to the Sawyer website, download the download the reports because they are really really interesting, and and obviously uh, access the newsletter to to be uh, updated on what's coming further because indeed from those forecasted scenarios trying to see exactly what does it mean in terms of new skills new jobs how how current jobs need to be adapted is uh, is something that we need to uh, we need to follow um okay i see time uh, running we're gonna go back to uh, the presentations of the slides um so in this last session what we will be doing uh, is actually introduce you to the to the fern 360 project um i have prepared video but i see as time is running that um maybe we'll leave you to watch it by yourself after the seminar then we can save a, a few minutes uh, just as a reminder the the recording and the slides will be made available after the webinar so for the people who registered you will be able to receive a link where all that information will be made uh, available. Uh, but just to, um, to, to reframe Fern 360, sorry. Um, so we've been working on it for the last uh, 30 months. So we're heading towards the end of the project. Um, what we want to show you now is basically the starting point, which I think we, we think is quite relevant because it's, it's about also identifying skills gap um, to actually being able to address those gaps in a, in a dedicated curriculum. So we'll present you uh, the first report that was the initial part of the, of the project, and then we'll go towards the content of the curriculum and the way we approach it as well in terms of the type of pedagogical uh, approach we've been, we've been doing. And at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll also show you a concrete live uh, life tutorial on how to actually access the platform. Um, but I would suggest that we go straight now to, to the, the skills gap that we, uh, we started working on in the beginning of the project. So Victoria. Hi everyone, I'm Victoria Gomez from the Kassler Institute of Technology in Germany. And I'm going to um, briefly introduce you to what we developed during the first step of the project. That was the report, Circular Economy in the Furniture Industry Overview of Current Challenges and Competencies Needs. This result belongs to the intellectual output one, and the main objective was to gather information on the skills and competencies needed to support the, the, the transition to a circular business model. This study also provides the, a, a complete analysis of the current situation about how the concept of circular economy is being implemented within this sector. So the methodology we used to achieve this goal uh, was divided into four steps. In the first one, 
Uh, the first one was a text research where we identified around 40 case studies spread across Europe in which there was a clear application of some of the principles of the circular economy. Then we selected the 25 uh, more, most representative cases, we contacted with the companies and we conducted the interviews previously designed to obtain the, the necessary information. The next step was to analyze all the responses and identify the gaps and key skills needed to make the transition to a circular model. In order to provide a clear overview of these uh, skill sets, we classified the competencies according to the various dimensions of the business model construct, using a back stage and front, front stage um, approach. Um, in the back, back stage side, we focused on the relevant skills necessary uh, in the resources, activities, and partner dimension of the circular business model. In the front stage side, we highlight the skills and competencies in value proposition, customer segment, customer relationship, and, and channels. And finally, we took a look at transversal competencies that support both the front stage and the back stage uh, of business model innovation. With all this, we moved on to the next phase of the project, which was the identification and definition of the learning outcomes of each of the models that form the structure of the joint curriculum of our training program. And this was done under the intellectual output uh, too. And to finish, I would like to um, emphasize that the report resulting from this work is available in the download section of our website in case, of any, in case any of you are interested in, in reading it. So thank you very much for your attention. This is all for me. And now uh, I would like to give the floor to our partner at uh, Vasa University. So thank you. Hello, um, I'm Nicoleta Sokali. I'm a researcher at Vasa University. And um, on this project, I will briefly talk about our training approach. I should probably start by saying that our course has seven modules and my colleagues will talk about this later on. And for each module, there's an introduction video, which is a presentation of the module content and its key insights, a course book, which includes uh, in-depth information about the topic. There are also PowerPoint presentations, so you can browse through the various sections of the module, infographics, where key concepts are visually explained, detailed concept videos to deep, uh, to deep dive into central knowledge of the module, additional reading materials to deepen the knowledge, and of course, an assessment quiz. So I think that will be all regarding the training approach that we took for this project. Uh, good morning to, to everyone. Julio Rodrigo speaking from CEMFIM in, in Spain. And as you are going to see in the next slide, so please see one. Uh, the curriculum of this course is organized around seven different modules. This uh, course requires a dedication or an effort of uh, 75 hours. Uh, the course con uh, also contains an extra and final practical module to apply the acquired knowledge and this last module also requires an effort of five hours. Next, please. In module one, uh, this is an introduction to the concept of uh, circular economy. As you are going to see, it contains five units. In unit one, uh, it uh, describes why the current linear system is facing challenges from a resource perspective. In unit two, uh, we describe what is behind the concept of circular economy. Unit three, presents the advantages of circular economy from multiple perspectives and addresses current barriers to its full implementation. Unit 4 shows how the circular economy is rooted in other existing concepts. And finally, Unit 5 positions the concept of circular economy with the general discourse on sustainability. Next, please. In module two, we present the concept of circular economy in the context of the furniture industry. The, the aim of unit one is to know the circularity current status in the European furniture sector, 
the aim of Unit 2 is to understand internal and external aspects to take into consideration in the transition toward a more circular economy. The objective of Unit 3 is to understand the legislative instruments to facilitate the transition to a circular economy. The objective of Unit 4 is to understand the available voluntary instruments. And finally, the aim of Unit 5 is to know successful and inspiring experiences of other uh, companies. In Model 3, uh, is about circular business model innovation. And Unit 1 provides basic knowledge on business model. Unit 2 clarifies the connection between sustainable business models and circular business models. Unit 3 defines circular business models. Unit, unit 4 shows an overview of circular economy strategies within the furniture industry. Unit 5 provides understanding of circular business model cases in the furniture industry. And finally, Unit 6 aims at integrating knowledge of the model in a case study adjustments. Model 4 is about business management in the circular furniture industry. The aim of its Unit 1 is to understand the role of networks in creating circular economy business models and its Unit 2 aims to equip trainees with tools to develop business and new value propositions from the opportunities presented by the transition towards a circular economy. Model 5 is about sustainability in the circular furniture industry. And the aim of its Unit 1 is to be familiar with the eco-design concept. The aim of Unit 2 is to be able to identify environmental aspects in a company and to learn general principles of the most important quality and environmental certifications. In Unit 3, the student will learn green communication tools based on the different eco-labels for furniture products. The aim of Unit 4 is to know what means product life cycle assessment, a carbon footprint, and an environmental product declaration. And finally, the aim of uh, the Unit 5 is to learn the implementation of eco-design requirements in companies. Module 6 is about marketing the circular industry. So the aim of its Unit 1 is to understand the marketing mechanisms to distribute circular products. Unit 2 aims to define the strategies to engage customers in value creation. And finally, Unit 3 examines the, consum the consumption practices in relation to circular products in the furniture industry. Module 7 is about key enabling uh, technologies. Unit 1 shows the connection between the circular economy and some of the key enabling technologies in the furniture and wood sector, thus visualizing some of the advantages of the application of these technologies in the circular model. And in its Unit 2, the main objective is the acquisition of knowledge for understanding of augmented reality and its possible applications within the circular economy in the furniture sector. Unit 3 focuses on 3D printing, Unit 4 on 3D, 3D scanning, Unit 5 on tracking systems, and finally, Unit 6 focuses on digital collaborative platforms. The training course uh, also contains a final uh, practical model that uh, requires carrying out a mini case. The mini cases are challenges launched, launched by companies and learners have to carry out um, a small investigation and briefly report their main results and conclusions. This model will be available only uh, now during the pilot of the course, but not in the, in the, in the future. And that's all regarding the, the curriculum. Thanks a lot. Uh, should, we, should we move to a, a live exercise of the training platform? Juanjo, if you want to take, uh, take the screen. Yes, hello everybody. I'm Juan Ortega from Amuebla, speaking. Okay, uh, this is the, <clears throat> the main home when you're entering the, in our uh, training platform. It's training.farm360.eu or you can go just directly through our website, uh, farm360.eu. 
it, uh, you can go directly here to login and create a new account and it's automatically you can create here your account you receive that as email with uh, your password and i'm going to enter with mine it's important to click here i'm not a robot and we enter uh, could you see the the my trainings the yes okay when we enter in the platform what we see is uh, the eight different modules uh, and one good presentation. I'm going just before to enter in one or uh, the module just to present here. We have here always the home, uh, the forum, messages in, in case you would like to, to send some messages to other students or teachers and my achievement when you can see your progress and which module have you passed or not and also to download the, the certificate when you finish. Uh, it is important to know that the, it's a flexible learning, so you don't need to go one by one, one module by after if before it, the, the following modules. You can go directly, for instance, to module five if you are interested in know about the label, or to module six if you are interested in just on marketing, circular unit. But to get the certificate, it is compulsory to pass the seven modules, not the mini case, as it, as Julio says uh, already, it's going to be just during the pilot and it's uh, also an optional uh, module. Just the seven modules, different modules, are compulsory for the certificate, but all the learnings are completely flexible, flexible and, and available. Okay, before to start with uh, one of the modules, I'm going just to present the course presentation. This is module zero, where you have a, um, you can find an infographic that shows you the structure of the course and also the methodology and how to pass the course. And it's in, it is important that when you enter in one of the modules, you have here always all the different units and all the different uh, modules, okay? You can go directly clicking on one of these. So here we have uh, in the course presentation, we have here the course book. The complete course book that is the book of the course it has uh, more than 300 pages now and the user guide in the uh, consortium languages english german spanish french and it will be available soon also in, in france you can go through here or also in on your left here for instance i click in the course book and we have it, it's going to take time because it's a the the higher or the standard uh, PDF, more than 300 pages. But basically, you have here the option to download. You can be, you can see online, but also you can download it and print it in your house or whatever. Okay. We have here also here the user guide available always in the different languages and explain also you how to manage with the platform and also the methodology to get the certificates and to pass the different assessments. I'm going to come back home here on the left, on the top, over here. And now I'm going to enter just to show the first module, how it works. Okay, the main paints when we enter in, the, in one of the modules is always the same. You have a short introduction and the video presentation of the module, okay? You have here a link to the complete uh, course book again, and here a link just to the course book of this model. And it is important to know this, uh, how to pass each module. At the end of the modules, we will find an assessment with 10 questions. It is here, okay? In the case of model one. Uh, all the students have three attempts to pass it, and the minimum requested score is 60 percent but question will change randomly after its attempts. And it is important to know that when we click it here, uh, it starts automatically the first attempt. For instance, I'm going to click in assessment of module two, and it starts. You can see you have 20 minutes here, and you have the 10 questions. If uh, you have three attempts, if you don't pass the, the first one, you have another one to make it later, okay? And now I'm going to 
click again here to the first module. And now we can go to the first uh, unit because we have the course book, but also in each of the units, we have a, a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, a slides here. Okay, we have also this option on our left, on our right, sorry. And we can uh, to expand it. We can download also the presentation. And what is this presentation? This presentation is a kind of a summary of the course book, but also it has additional materials. It has uh, videos, it has uh, infographics, that will support our learning, our learning path, okay? We recommend to read it, uh, the course book and also uh, take a look of all the presentation and the additional material that we have here. For instance, uh, I know that in unit 1.2, we have here uh, some videos, link to videos directly in the, in the presentation. That is, Okay, for instance here. Okay, this is something that you don't have in the in the course book, for instance. And also we have some infographic in some of the in different units. Okay, uh, what else? In in each of the modules at the end, you have here the five units of module one. We have a reading list that this is additional uh, readings in case you go you want to go deeper in in a specific topics and assessment at the end. I'm going to show you, this is, uh, in this case, is for the Helen MacArthur Foundation. This is a link that uh, gives you directly to these uh, materials. And you have also here in module three, 3.1, 3.2, and at the end you have the reading list and the assessment. There is one additional uh, menu here on the top of our right. Maybe the most important is files when you have the course book of the modules and lessons. Here, you can see also all the different units in a different way for this, uh, just for this module, and when you have passed one or not, okay? And at the end, we have also here the number of attempts of the assessment. Uh, at the end, I'm going to show you just uh, the mini case that this is going to be open just until September. It's just uh, a link with um, a PDF with six different cases, real cases uh, for, I suppose, uh, from uh, companies. You need to select uh, to choose one of the mini cases and work on it in the in in the same PDF that you develop uh, you download. And going here, continue you can here upload uh, your, your answer to, to us and we will get you some feedback on it, okay? And I think that's all. If you have any question, that for sure, you have it, you can now after the webinar or during the, or whatever in, in the Gmail that is here in the good presentation, you have the Gmail of the, the email account of the project. Thank you. Thank you for the, this quick presentation. Um, I believe we are running a little bit out of time, but it might still be relevant to uh, try to answer the, the questions that were asked in the, in the Q&A at least. Um, so if I go back to it. Um, one, one, one question was actually answered by Ilma when it comes to the, the Circulatix tools. So uh, that information is available online and, and free to access. Um, Typhoon was actually asking the biggest hinder for multiple usage of furniture and implementing refurbishment and remanufacturing. Uh, that's something we are actually tackling within the course. So maybe Typhoon can, can uh, uh, definitely enroll and get that information in, in a short short term. I mean, what we can what, what we can say is that there's in indoors or issues related to the production patterns. So again, like issues related to design for refurbishment, design for repairability. So those those are uh, aspects that need to be in place. There's logistics issues also on how to be able to implement reverse logistics procedures. 
um, and, but also from a consumption perspective, I think the, the, the marketing and communication issue is, is how you can translate and communicate to the end users that actually a re, re, remanufactured, refurbished furniture is actually as valuable and as quality as, as a new product. And, and for that, there's actually marketing tricks and, and uh, suggestions that we also cover in the, in the course. Um, and Daniel was actually asking uh, uh, successful and unsuccessful business model cases. So as you may have seen in the presentation, um, we have a lot of case studies throughout the modules that basically exemplify what we are trying to, uh, to teach. So it's, it's been really important for us to, uh, to, to get best practices even before starting designing the course so that we actually know what were the issues, the challenges but also the, the, the good, uh, good practices in order to, uh, to be successful in, in uh, launching circular um, businesses in the, in the industry. And Adams was also asking how exactly is the furniture environmental assessment performed already at the design stage to have maybe results in figures to be able to choose the greener one, what is recommended in this matter? Uh, is it something, Ilma, you want to reply maybe in relation with circular ethics or... or in general, or what do you think? Wait, which question? Can you repeat the question? The, um, the last question from Adam, yeah. how is exactly the environmental assessment performed already at the design stage? Uh, is it something you, you are able to, um, to reply through the circular ethics tool or? Assessment performed. I... Circolytics, I don't think I can reply through circolytics. I think this is more of a design question. Uh, environmental, how environmental assessment is performed at the design stage. So it's almost like how do you embed things like life cycle assessment that includes yeah. environmental aspects at the design stage. I wouldn't say that's my area of expertise. Uh, maybe my colleague Anna would even have more about it. In terms of circolytics, uh, it, circolytics looks into inputs and outputs and also assesses what processes you have in place. So I wouldn't say that circolytics would be helpful in this, in this case to embed environmental assess assessment into the design stage. It's a different focus. Uh, that's all I can say, actually. Mm. But but LCA tool uh, that I mentioned in the course also may may be the the right tools to um, to at the design stage, you know, take the right decisions that can uh, allow you to to uh, to decide which material and which impact, uh, you know, is preferable. Yes, if I can say some few words, Irwin. Uh, as you already commented, in Module 5, we pay attention to sustainability in the furniture industry. And in Unit 4, we present uh, the concept of life cycle assessment, a carbon footprint, or an environmental product declaration. And we describe uh, these tools and how to implement in, in, in our sector. And I think that probably is, is the most appropriate unit for this, uh, this purpose. All right, and I think there was also one question uh, when it comes to the translation of the course into Ukrainian. Um, this is something that will really, really depends on the purpose of the translation. Um, we, we are uh, under a Creative Commons license, so uh, you can access the course for free. Uh, but there's restriction when it comes to making use of it for commercial purposes. So uh, if you have more like specific questions, uh, hola, related to the diffusion of the course in Ukrainian, please just send us an email and uh, we can discuss that further. I mean, the point, the point of this project, obviously, is to make sure that information is available for all and is put into good use because we, we want to accelerate the, tra the transition to circular economy in the sector. So obviously, if it can be used in, in, uh, in Ukraine or in other countries, we are more than happy uh, about that. But um, I think we are, we, are, we are almost running out of time. We're a bit uh, late when it comes to, um, to the webinar. Maybe I just wanted to have a quick, uh, a quick maybe uh, main takeaways. Can you see my, uh, can you see my screen now? Um, just, yes. just to try to summarize what was, was, was said, I think, in the, throughout, throughout the, the discussions. Obviously, circularity 
sustainability is becoming a stronger and stronger priority for the furniture industry. Um, I think several panelists really uh, stressed the need for a common language and understanding. So what are we talking about? What are, what are the glossary? What do we really mean when we talk about circular economy? It goes beyond recycling. There's a lot more uh, to that. So I think this is really, uh, really key to, to push that forward. Uh, Gabriela talked about the need for harmonization, the value chain approach, dialogue and collaboration. I think this is also something that, um, that uh, the foundation and MacArthur was also focusing on. So when it comes to key skills, um, understanding and communicating the concept, being able to assess the circularity of products, material and components, very, very, very key aspects. Tools do exist. I think it's important to... Um, to, to know that you can actually access some existing tools already uh, at the foundation website. So please do so uh, to, to, to start walking the talk. And when, we, when it comes to training needs, yeah, on the concept again, and this is something that, uh, that needs to be uh, re, re uh, affirmed. How can we talk about circular economy? What does it entail? Uh, what does it mean at product level, at material level, at business model level, but also at, uh, at system level? When we want to change our whole industry, uh, we need to, to think way wider into systems and go beyond silos, think about uh, cross-sectoral collaborations as well. Uh, and I think one last point that also was, was uh, distilled through the presentations is the role of consumers. How can we go further in engaging with the consumer through information, but also through uh, explaining concretely how uh, you know furniture can be repaired to extend the lifetime the li lifetime of the product. How can it go back uh, to to the to the producer? What kind of strategies are now emerging when it comes to shifting from uh, product ownership to product access? So this is still something that uh, we'll need a lot of focus on in the coming years. Um, but we are on we are on our way, I, I think, and. Um, and there's already a lot, a lot to, um, to, to, to learn from, from this kind of project that uh, we, uh, we introduced today. Um, I think this is it for, uh, for today. So I hope you did learn something in this short uh, an hour and a half. Uh, as you have registered, so in a couple of days, we'll be able to, uh, to send you the materials that were presented, but also a recorded version of the webinar so that if you think that some of your colleagues are interested uh, in, in getting that information, well, please do forward it. And otherwise, if you're interested in, in, in joining the course, well, please do so. It's free and uh, we would be really happy to have you guys uh, using that platform. But um, that's about it for me. I do hope you've had a good time and I, I wish you a um, Happy weekends and, uh, and for the people who are soon on holidays, well, happy holidays. Thank you.